By the 11th of December, three days before the auction at the National Museum of Romance, I had successfully liquidated almost all of my assets. Everything I owned was tagged with a red, blue or green dot and exposed to the residents of my apartment building for evaluation. I netted a total of $440, not to mention the priceless memory of the faces of my unknown fellow tenants as they bumped around my one-bedroom hole in search of the perfect deal on a toaster oven. I withdrew my remaining bank funds in cash, $1,183. I left the bank at noon on Friday the 14th with nothing more than the clothes on my back, a little over $2,800 in my pocket, and a rental car. I drove three hours south to Atlantic City. A light rain began to fall at two o'clock, and by the time I got to the end of the expressway, I could see the town only through a steady water wash. I parked the car at the first casino I came to, the Tropicana. I walked through the garage, down two flights of cement steps, through a gently arcing tunnel with a starry night lighting motif, and entered the gaming floor. I bought $2,300 worth of plastic chips, stuck a $20 bill in my front pocket of my cheap overcoat for safekeeping, and bought chips totaling another $510. When that task was completed, the 20 in my pocket represented the whole of my net liquid worth. I went to the first roulette table I saw. I waited patiently through one complete turn of the wheel. Then I stepped forward and placed my life savings on the small dyed rectangle representing the color black. The other gamers looked at me. I did not look back. Someone came up beside me on my left, a harmless onlooker. From all around, there was a vapid chiming of slot machines. When the dealer spun the wheel, I looked across the room into meaningless space. I stood ruler straight in my heavy J.C. Penny overcoat and uncombed hair, looking to everyone around me like a thin, pale drunk about to embark on a weekend bender. The man who ran the table called something out, and the gamers applauded, and a second stack of chips joined my first. A hand slapped my back. I took my chips and converted them, requesting cash. I placed my original 2800 in my wallet and the money that Providence had provided me in my overcoat on top of the 20 I'd set aside for bourbon. Then I walked quickly out of the casino. Once in my rental car, I had great difficulty inserting my key into the ignition. I squeezed my eyes shut and listened to the sound of the rain muted through the sealed glass of the vehicle. Then I began to shake just a little. It lasted five minutes. Half an hour after I got into the car, I exited the parking garage and drove away from the city. It was 48 minutes southwest from there to the nothing town of Tristia. I got there well after dark had fallen. The directions that the museum's public relations department had issued in an email to tomorrow's bidders were quite poor, and I became lost twice in the twisting rural landscape that surrounded my destination. About half a mile short of Leo Road, I saw orange blinking flashes ahead on my right. The stopped car was a Mercedes. I went past it and pulled over to the shoulder, queuing my own flashes before I stepped out into the rain. I splashed quickly through the forming puddles and approached the car. The driver's side window was rolled down with the push of a button. The driver was a woman in her mid to late thirties, with jet black hair tied in a very orderly ponytail. Her makeup was flawless her grey coat expensive. She'd pulled over to check her directions and the car wouldn't start up again. She asked if I could run her up to the museum. She opened a door and ran like hell for the passenger side of the rental car. Her high heels clacked on the pavement and I was afraid she might slip and fall, but she moved rather smoothly. She exhaled heavily with great satisfaction when I started the car and pulled back onto the road. A small metallic blue sign came up immediately on the right. It featured only the silhouetted image of a bird hovering beside a flower, wings outstretched. The logo of the Museum of Romance. An arrow pointed straight ahead. Are you going to be at the auction as well? The woman asked me. Yes, I said. I'll have someone tow the car tomorrow. Did you get a little lost like I did? Very much so, I told her. Are you going to bid on anything? She asked. The road curved slightly to the left and the museum came into view. I think so, I said. I'm trying to sell an article about the museum to a magazine, she told me. Which one? 
she shrugged. Anyone? What's the item you're bidding on? I made a right turn. The museum's parking lot was gravel. About twenty other cars were in the lot. It's a key, I said simply, hoping she would not ask anything more. A key? Just one key, she asked. What is it open? Nothing, I said. It wasn't made to open anything at all. A key, she said again, seeming amused. Does it have a good story behind it? I pulled into the space between a Saab and a Civic, much like the one I'd owned for eight years and sold three days before. I imagine it's listed in the catalogue somewhere, I said, and stepped out into the rain again. The National Museum of Romance was nothing more than a tasteful pre-war two-storey house, set off by itself by a little-used rural connecting road that joined two highways. The lights of cars on Route 74 could be seen far away through the rain and surrounding foliage, heading towards places with both far more and far less money. The large yard was dotted by carefully placed oak trees, suggesting a care on the part of the original owners that perhaps had not been equaled by those who'd come afterwards. The woman and I ran behind another couple along a winding front walk bordered by red roses, almost slipping several times, and then ascended three steps to the front door. It was propped open and guarded by a very short black man of about sixty, who welcomed guests into the foyer and asked for their names between myopic jests about the downpour. We gave ours and entered, drenched, risking pneumonia because the house's air conditioning was cranked too high. If we walked to the right, we'd be inside the museum's introductory room, which is to say the living room, where in dim, red-tinted lighting I could see nine or ten glass display cases standing empty and useless. We were ushered to the left, down a dark hallway, which opened up into the banquet room and conference centre, a sterile enclosure looking out through three dozen oval windows into the darkness of the black yard. There were about twelve circular tables waiting for us, each prepared to seat eight guests. The seating had been pre-assigned according to the order by which we had bought our tickets, and so my female companion moved off to the right after offering me a small apologetic wave, and I was guided by a girl of college age to a table very close to the front, near a lectern sitting on a modest rental podium. There seemed to be three or four college girls moving frenetically about the banquet room, smiling cheerfully and seating the guests, all of whom were dressed better than I was. Apparently they were thinking that this was a real night out. They were museum benefactors, local business people, and potential bidders like me, who would walk away with a small part of the museum's holdings the next day. There were just two chairs on the podium. They were occupied by a slick-haired young man and a skeletally thin woman who pressed a clipboard firmly to her chest. She seemed to be boring him with instructions that he obviously found unnecessary. The low buzz of conversation was killed simply by gentle tapping on the lectern's microphone. Thankfully, my seven table mates had not introduced themselves to me. I clung to my theory that to them I looked lost, uncomfortable and exhausted and quite possibly drunk. The last thing I saw before the slick-haired man spoke into the mic was the woman I'd given a ride to, smiling at me from thirty feet and two tables away. She did not drop the smile until I looked away, through the window over my left shoulder, at the rapidly flooding backyard. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Museum of Romance, said the young MC with professional gaiety. My name is Rance Munchik, and I'll be your host for dinner tonight, as well as your auctioneer tomorrow. You may know my face from the News at Five on WKYWCBS, where it was certainly not me who foolishly predicted fair skies and zero humidity tonight. The crowd laughed. About fifty hands reached for their wine glasses. Nor was I responsible for the uh, rather dubious road directions all of you were given for tonight's journey, he said. Those directions were printed under the guidance of Miss Ellen Roth, who is sitting to my right, and who put a bit too much faith, I think she'd agree, in some outdated mapping software. Ellen, by the way, is the museum's day-to-day -day guardian. If you visited any time over the past two years, you would have almost certainly seen her in the foyer, handing you your ticket and answering your questions. She's been one of the best friends the museum ever had. Of course, the very best friend the museum ever had is a gentleman named Archer Rand, its curator. It was he who in 1997 founded the museum and oversaw its evolution into one of the most unique attractions in the state, if not the country. In the beginning, it wasn't much more than a business proposition to Archer, one in a long series of them. 
After Archer fought proudly in Vietnam, awarded the Silver Star for courage under fire, he became an entrepreneur. Some of his ventures included a deal to sell 20,000 American television sets to people in Finland, part ownership in a silk screening company, and part ownership in an enterprise that took people on sailing adventures around the world. One day in 1987, a friend asked him what he really enjoyed most in life. The answer was history. More specifically, Archer was a museum buff. It almost didn't matter to him what was inside them. He loved the reverential silence in those places, the sense of humility towards the past. He spent Thanksgiving Day of 1993 at the house of an employee of the sailing company he co-owned. The man's daughter, a red-haired girl, all of seven years old, spoke up in the middle of a conversation between the guests about unusual museums. The little girl, whose name was Angie, said quite suddenly, there should be a museum where people get in love. It didn't take long for Archer to work this inspiration into an idea which was fruited right inside this house. Thank you, Angie. Someone clapped, then another person, then there was a brief bout of kind applause. So Archer put this idea into the capable hands of others for a while, Munchik went on. Three men and three women went out and began to collect the first items of the Tristia Museum of Romance which is often flatteringly but mistakenly referred to as the National Museum of Romance. The researchers had a tough go of it at first. Where would one start with a project like this? For it was Archer's idea to concentrate the holdings not on the personal mementos of the famous and infamous, but of everyday folk, people who would give up the things they held most dear so that others could come and bask in the lessons of the romances, heartbreaks and triumphs they had. Overall, more than 600 items have been displayed here at the museum over the years, each priceless to the person who surrendered them for public view. There is a bit of a minor secret to be revealed tonight, and Ellen here has agreed to allow me to reveal it. Since 1997, no one but the museum's original founder has truly understood the meaning of the museum's logo, which most of you followed tonight to get to this house, turning left and right, where the image of a hummingbird suspended in air beside a simple flower told you to. A hummingbird in flight, hovering beside a flower. It was designed by one of the museum's original researchers, Jenna Mantoy. When a hummingbird leaves the ground and hovers magically in the air, its wings can flap at almost 70 times per second, so fast that the wings are a meaningless blur to anyone watching. Only when a picture is snapped with a very expensive, very high-speed camera can its wings be fully seen in mid-movement, one split second captured in the haze of rapid motion, a single image stolen from that blur. To Jenna, romance was like that. Romance, the beginning of love, was that split second which two people somehow managed to capture in the blur of our time on Earth, using every bit of belief in their hearts to do so. The rest of life is so often the rapid, repetitive beating of wings which keeps us afloat. Jenna liked to think that this museum was, essentially, nothing less than a place filled with snapshots of a hummingbird's stilled wings, moments suspended in time. All told, in the museum's seven-year existence, more than 60,000 people have walked through the rooms of this house. Now the museum must close. It doesn't seem fair, of course, but it's economically unavoidable. Hopefully, many of you will drive away with a love story in your possession, and these love stories will go with you to every part of the country. You will not be the first to go home holding a priceless artifact of the Museum of Romance. That blessing belonged to a burglar who came here only last May, who broke into the museum with a very specific purpose in mind. The only incidents of theft in the museum's history, and the evidence of it, which the burglar left behind, was actually displayed as a rotating exhibit until that broken glass was given to Ellen Roth here as a thank you for all her years of hard work. It was a rainy night like this one when the burglar came. He broke through a window in this very room. If you look directly to my left and count three windows over, that's the one he came through. He crawled into this room and then crossed it in muddy sneakers. You ladies and gentlemen seated at the table in the centre point of the room are sitting directly on the path he took. He went right through the foyer and into the National Museum of Romance. I'm sorry, the Tristia Museum of Romance. The lone security camera here watched and recorded that burglar for a full 20 minutes as he entered the main room, walked right up to one of the exhibits, 
and removed it from its stand. The videotape shows a fuzzy, soundless black and white image of the man as he took the exhibit directly to the closest chair where he immediately sat down with it as if he was sitting in his own living room. The exhibit was a diary. The man opened it, scanned some of its pages, and then began to read. He sat there, reading, engrossed, while the rain seeped through the hole in the window of this very room and collected in a pool on the floor. Finally, he got up out of the chair, walked back through the foyer, walked back through the banquet room, and left. It was obvious that the burglar had been here before, knew exactly which exhibit he wanted, and upon finding it, determined that it was indeed something he needed to have. The police believed his name must have been in the diary, that he was a central character in its story. There are people to whom these artifacts are not just artifacts, but living testimony to their own invaluable history. So I propose a toast. A toast to that burglar who walked across this room with such determination and passion for his goal. Your muddy footsteps across this wooden floor, good sir, are all we ever needed to believe in true love. After Rance Munchik's speech and the applause which saw him off the podium, we ate dinner. The college girls poured wine and water. Miss Roth shook my hand and said it was nice to see me. I told her I'd never been to the museum and had only heard about his existence three weeks before, and then she thankfully moved on. My dinner companions respected my silence, and I offered precious little to the conversation. The woman I'd driven with looked across the room at me a great deal between the long conversations with everyone around her. She excused herself a couple of times and returned with her hair and makeup carefully freshened. I nodded politely the first time we made eye contact, and after that I found myself looking more and more at the window through which the cat burglar had entered, trying to make out the tiny crack in the woods surrounding the panes. Outside, the rain kept falling. My rider caught me in the foyer after dinner. Could you run me over to the hotel, she asked. So it was another gauntlet run back to the car. Never had two people so boldly tempted pneumonia before. It was only a three-minute drive to the hotel, if that. A quick turn out onto Forest Road, and then the first right onto Telpenham. After making a brief reference to the brevity of the auction dinner, the woman took a silver Hitachi mini cassette recorder out of her purse and pressed play. She frowned and pushed a couple of buttons as she first had to squint at it in order to determine their function. Then she groaned and let her head fall back against her seat rest. I don't believe it, she said, running her right hand again and again through her now freed long black hair. I was recording on the wrong speed. This is gibberish. She dropped the recorder back into her purse. I turned the car and the Temple Inn was just ahead of us. I sensed rather than saw the woman turn her head back to me. Any interest in getting quietly drunk, she asked. Kind of a morose, just let it all end drunk. Into another parking lot. The fifth of the day for me. You don't want to get to work writing down however much you remember, I asked her. No, I do not, she said. I want to look back on today through a total haze. All right then, I said to her. There was satisfaction on her face as she applied a new layer of lipstick to her already vivid lips. The bar in the hotel, which consisted of only four tables, four stools, and a dimness which held no tangible atmosphere, was only open until ten, so we shared but an hour or so in there. We were the only patrons except for a young priest of all people. He sat, sallow, in one corner, stretching out a mug of beer for more than forty-five minutes before he left the room. The woman's name, as it turned out, was Sandra. She was from Boston. We talked about New England, the fits and starts of her writing career, and what she'd learned of the unintentionally humorous lives of the other people at dinner. I did not get drunk, and she seemed to hold her liquor even better than I. When the bar closed and the lights were turned out, she stayed there, sitting in almost complete darkness, smoking a cigarette, while I checked in. She was actually not a guest of the hotel yet, and yet she decided fifteen minutes before that she would not be. The Temple Inn was obviously not worth the price, and she wanted instead to head for Ella Quinta four miles up the road. It was principal, she explained. She wanted to call a cab from my room. She hated dealing with desk people. She entered the room a step or two behind me. I dropped my coat on a chair 
and flipped a switch on the wall for the overhead light. The decor of the room was predictably bland, just in a more oppressively Victorian style than the Holiday Inn I'd considered before I made my reservation. I crossed the room to the obscenely large bureau, which apparently expected a family of six to stay in the place for half a year or more. How much could it cost to run that place? Sandra asked rhetorically. She fingered the low-cut neck of her fashionable black dress. How is it that the museum could close, do you think? I took off my watch, set it down atop the bureau, followed it with my wallet and keys. Maybe eight dollars was a bit much to charge to peek into the diaries of total strangers, I said. She stood with her back against the wall, beside the television set, and looked dreamily out of the window which overlooked the parking lot. Did you want to call a cab, I asked her, nodding towards the phone beside her right hand. She stirred not an inch, not even to glance instinctively at the phone I directed her to. Only after a strange silence had passed did she drag her gaze away from it and look directly at me. Yes, well, she said, syllables meaning nothing at all. Is there something you wanted to ask me? I looked at her as blankly as I could. She had drawn one foot off the floor, just a couple of inches, pressing the short heel of her right shoe against the wall which supported her back. The eye contact she made with me was unwavering. No, I said softly. I went over to the night table and pulled out the top drawer. There were the yellow pages, just as I thought, just where the hotel history dictated they must be. Your body language says otherwise, Sandra said. It has all night. It's told me all kinds of things about you. Has it? I said. I know from it, said this woman, this total stranger, that you'd rather die than talk to new people. You've been alone for at least two years, and that you'd just let luck decide the women you wind up with. I think you probably swear a lot when you're by yourself too, but never in front of anyone else. Her eyes were bright, alert, unaffected by the wine and the hour. Very good, I said tightly, and walked back to the bureau, which was as far away from her as I could possibly get. I know that you don't want me to leave, she said. Do you want to hear what I want? I shook my head. I'm afraid that's going to be moot tonight, I told her. I'm exhausted. The auction is in ten hours. But you'd like me to stay all night, wouldn't you? She said, almost in a whisper. I actually want more than that, she went on. Can you imagine it? You want just the one night. I want many of them. So what do you think we should do? Finally, finally, she moved from the wall and took a single step forward. Talk it over, she asked. It's really getting late for that. You've gotten the body language all wrong, I told her. I don't want either. No, I've got it exactly right. You can't lie. You're a man. You'll see through, she half smiled. Why don't you make the decision for us, then, based on my body language, I said. But knowing well, we'd never see each other again. If she had come to me at that moment, as it seemed she would, we would have met as equals and played our parts as a million other people had done and forgotten about it all when the sun rose, with no serious losses on either side. For the past seventeen years, any act of intimacy between two human beings was to me, of no more consequence than a cash transaction at a hardware store. That's too easy, she said instead. Tell me what's wrong with making things difficult and complicated. You're in your forties. Better things be difficult in an involvement with me than lying alone in some hotel room and your little apartment night after night. I prefer simple, I said, turning away from her, ready to bid her a final good night. Yes, yes, heaven's me, she said. Yes, I'm sorry I didn't see the equation. It's so much simpler to show up here and throw some money at the museum tomorrow for a key, one silly key, so you can stay stuck forever in the past. So you can stay stuck forever in the past. But that's what she really, really did not know. She had just revealed herself to be grossly misinformed, short-sighted, and I told her so because I was not then, nor have I ever been, stuck in the past. I knew exactly how to work with the past. I knew precisely when to set my foot back into it, precisely when to take it out again, 
how long to stay there and how much of myself to commit. It had taken me 20 years, but I'd learned every trick. I could come and go there as I pleased, and I was an expert at it. I was no prisoner. I could swap back and forth with no trace either way, so no one, not one person on earth, ever even knew I was gone. This was my great skill, the thing in life I had mastered. If I was stuck in the past, I could not function as beautifully as I did as an employee and a citizen and a son to a dying mother. I was an athlete of the mind, and as I told her only with the thinnest strands of my will keeping me from shrieking it, I was utterly free. But Sandra did not leave, even then. My sudden vocal attack of venom, my scorn for her underestimation of my abilities, did not frighten her out of the hotel room. She reached over and turned off the lights by hitting the single switch on the wall. She became an outline in the dark. She moved without a sound to the high-backed wicker chair, sitting in the corner near the bathroom, and she lowered herself into it. The time in that room became measured by the thousands of tiny beats of rain on the roof against the window. 10,000 drops, 20,000. And we remained far away from each other in utter darkness. She waited in that chair as if for a job interview or an appointment with someone who was running late. I did not believe in stalemates. I believed in resolutions, one way or the other. And if I found myself on the losing end, so be it. Losing meant quiet and forgetting quickly and giving up nothing of any real worth to me. I did not debate restaurant bills, politics, wrongly delivered mail, divorces. So I went to her. There was no sex. Somewhere in there as we lay on the bed, moving around each other with incredible slowness, she said that we had to be like no one else on earth at this precise moment. I shut my mind down for good and felt her hands on my chest, on my back, my stomach, my legs. She was like a powerful undertow, impossible to maneuver through. Even the kisses felt like they were nothing more than sound waves through deep water. I think I fell asleep holding her, both of us almost still fully dressed on top of the covers. Against her desires, we became like almost everyone else on earth. A married couple finding they were too old to discover the secrets in one another, and who had found the room's blackness and the comfort of the bed itself was a more acceptable ocean. I woke up in the middle of the night. Disoriented, I believed I was late for work, had in fact missed the entire day, somehow slept straight through it. I only realised my error because it was still raining, still, still, and that tapping sound brought it all clear. Sandra was gone. She'd made an effort to smooth out her side of the bed, and the bathroom light was off. I got up creakily, went to the window. The highway was not too far off. Through the trees I could see the shadow of a billboard, unlit, but no headlights went by. The clock radio told me it was 3.51am. I went into the bathroom, switched on the light. Written on the wide mirror in very careful slashes of guest hand soap, all in capital letters of a feminine hand, was the sentence, You kept saying the word slanderer in your sleep. I left those words there for the chambermaid to erase. I went back into the room and reached for my keys atop the bureau. My wallet had been opened and all of its contents set out neatly in a row. Driver's license, library card, visa card, social security card, car rental receipt. My keys rested beside it all. The money inside the wallet, the $2,800 that I'd won at the Tropicana, was gone. I knew she had taken it even before I'd bothered to rummage through my pants, my shirt, and all the drawers in the room, and my coat, where the original stake of 2800 still remained, and which she had somehow overlooked. She'd taken only the money I had gained for use at the auction, rendering my gambit at the casino meaningless. I got on the phone. The man at the front desk remembered my bedmate walking through the lobby sometime around three o'clock. She'd not taken the whole wallet, which would have been so much easier and quicker, 
she'd laid everything out first, in a line. In this way, I would not be inconvenienced by the loss of my license or my credit cards. At 4.15am, the second resident of room 16 left the temple in unexpectedly, passing the desk clerk without a word. I walked on hurriedly through the rain to my car, got in, and mentally reversing and correcting the mongoloid directions the museum had provided me, drove down Leo Road towards Petersburg Road, and then took a turn onto 83. I drove past the place where the woman named Sandra had claimed to have broken down, and of course there was no dark red Mercedes there anymore. I was on the Atlantic City Expressway by 4.25, driving without the sound of the radio through the pre-dawn gloom. I drove 35 miles to Atlantic City and to the Tropicana Hotel and Casino. I parked two stories below the spot where I'd parked the afternoon before. I got out of the car and walked through the appropriate tunnels toward the gaming floor. They had to open the roulette table for me. At five in the morning there were precious few gamblers. I saw two skinny Asian men sitting in a glass-enclosed poker room, playing face-to-face. -face. Three old women dressed for church sat in a row at the dollar slots, appearing wide awake, each holding a bucket full of tokens and feeding them in one by one. I took the exact same pile of stake money I'd placed on black the day before, converted it into chips, and pushed it all onto the exact same rectangle. This time, I did not withhold twenty dollars. Everything was placed on the table. Everything. The wheel spun. No one was around me this time. No one was watching. A woman in her fifties with matchsticks for legs came up behind me, wanting to offer me a coke from her tray. The silver ball settled. The man at the wheel clapped his hands in a robotic gesture and pushed $2,800 in chips next to the original $2,800. I picked it all up, turned away without a single word, cashed them in, and went back to my car. I felt as if I was going to throw up six feet from it. At last, the slanderer was ready for the auction at the National Museum of Romance. Lot 8. From the Copper Room. A two-by-two-and-a-half-foot cement block chiseled from the Flint River Bridge in Burlington, Iowa in 1971. Donated by the Iowa State Police. On the afternoon of December 31, 1971, an Iowa State trooper radioed a code Sadie to his dispatcher, who tiredly passed on this information to the Iowa State Transportation Commission. A code Sadie was a pure invention of the Iowa State Highway Patrol. It meant that once again, a very specific piece of graffiti had been spotted defacing one of the state's bridges, overpasses, or tunnels. Come back, Sadie. Forgive my mistake, the graffiti always read, in careful script letters ranging from two to eight feet high in red, blue, green, sometimes yellow paint. The first message had been spotted almost two years before, in the autumn of 1969. And in the ensuing two years, 277 such messages were found scrawled over a radius of 200 square miles. The Vandal, who came to be known comically in the newspapers and on local television as Sadie's ex, was never apprehended by the police for his misdeeds. An article about the poignant ordeal, printed in the Hawkeye Times of Burlington, featured a handwriting expert's professional opinion that, aside from a few poorly crafted imitations, all the known messages begging Sadie to forgive her lover's mistake were indeed drawn by the same hand. The text of the message never changed, was always exactly the same, six words, and six words only. The boldest of the graffiti strikes was found on the face of the law library at Iowa State University in October of 1971. Many in Iowa were secretly, and sometimes not so secretly, disappointed when Sadie's ex apparently stopped begging for her return in early 1972. No new graffiti strikes were ever found in the state. But then, in late 1973, an Iowan vacationing with her sister in Montrose, Georgia, spotted those infamous six words on an overpass on Highway 16 and called her husband to spread the word. 
She saw the message twice more during her vacation and contacted the local paper to inform them that Sadie's ex, so notorious back home in Iowa, but utterly unheard of in Georgia, could be expected to leave his mark again, and soon. And so he did. Come back, Sadie, forgive my mistake, appeared 15 more times on Georgia's bridges, overpasses, and tunnels. Nothing compared to what Sadie's ex had done in Iowa, but still a great deal of work and damage. Some assumed that Sadie must have moved to Georgia, and that her old lover had followed, continuing his pleadings in a warmer climate. The last known graffiti strike was left by Sadie's ex sometime in the winter of 1973. An Iowa photographer named Hodge Frawley published a slim coffee table book in 1980, which used the forlorn lover's full message as its title. The book consisted of the author's 41 best photographs of that message and the always empty roads it seemed to be speaking to, as taken in the years 1970 to 1973 in both Iowa and Georgia. No one ever came forward to claim that he was the vandal who had cried out so often for Sadie's return, and the object of his passion never revealed herself. To this day, their secret remains their own. Urban legend has it that Sadie was actually Sarah Jastra, who lived in both Iowa and Georgia at times that coincided with the graffiti, and later moved to Florida, where she became a three-term congresswoman. Sadie is a Hebrew-given name, a diminutive of Sarah. And it is rumored that in 2002, she traveled back to Iowa to attend the private funeral of an indigent man named Gregory Gray who for two decades had been in and out of VA hospitals and prison on vagrancy, theft, and breaking and entering charges. Supposedly, she left a piece of cloth on his simple headstone that read, My love, you are forgiven. By one o'clock, half of the items in the museum's collection had been sold. The longest breakup letter ever written 214 pages, and a trove of notes supposedly compiled by Edgar Allan Poe for a never-written non-fiction study of human loneliness were the stars of a somewhat muted show. Placing an item such as the Poe collection on sale, along with the forgotten arcano of everyday romances, drew quite a curious flock to the auction. About 200 people gathered in the banquet room where the dinner had been held the night before, a crowd divided about evenly between professional collectors interested only in the big-ticket items and the fleetingly curious townsfolk who would have showed up for any estate sale or flea market. The most highly contested item outside of the couple of true collectibles was an unclaimed decades-old Whitman sampler that had been discovered incredibly near the summit of Mount McKinley on Valentine's Day. It attracted a price of $300. A prop from the film She'll Come Back Again which starred a famous actress who died a virgin at 30, having known love only on the screen never in real life, went for 280. The unauthenticated Poe notes were contested by 12 or 13 different men and women, and they finally sold for $7,800. A pair of dolls, once owned by a rather extraordinary little German girl, was snatched at some length for 500 I saw nothing in the faces of the people in the crowd that suggested any of them had any sort of personal stake in the items they bid on, unlike the burglar who'd stolen his prize diary a few months before. Perhaps I would be the only one then who could point to Lot 30 and say, if I were that kind of person, I was there. As I sat in the back row, I found myself clasping and unclasping my right hand around the assemblage of $20 and $50 bills in my coat pocket and forced myself to stop. There was a break at one so people could gorge themselves on the buffet table. I took the opportunity to step out a side door which opened from the room out onto the lawn. I was not followed. No one else wanted to even set foot in an outside world, locked in a rainfall that cold, that dour. I stood under a small overhang and watched as the lawn disappeared under the wet wrath of God, stared emptily at the enormous woodpile which bordered the woods to the west. There was someone standing twenty feet to my right, protected by the overhang as well. 
It was a small man flanked by two lumpy black garbage bags, which he had obviously hauled out to dispose of. He wore dark green overalls. He coughed twice, asthmatically. I walked over to him, sticking very close to the building so as not to get wet, and asked him for the correct time. Are you waiting for a particular item? he asked me. Yes, I said. Things are moving a bit slower than I thought they would. If you don't mind my asking, he inquired, which item are you bidding on? You're familiar with them? I asked. Yes, he said. I work here. Lot 30, I said. Lot 30? he asked softly. That should be a very successful one for us. My name is Rand, he said. Archer Rand? I asked him. The curator of the museum? Yes, he said. I told him my name. Really? he said wonderingly. His face was wrinkled and weather-beaten. He was in his late fifties or so, but had dyed his short, messy hair ridiculously perfect brown, leaving none of it uncoloured, as if even the slightest hint of age was too much for him. He looked like an overgrown hobbit. Is there any chance, I said, that I could buy the item outright before it comes up? He seemed genuinely pained, penitent. I'm sorry, people have come just to bid on that item alone, he told me. You know, these legal affairs. You look almost exactly how I pictured you, he said. I've only met three others who are part of the stories, but you, you're extraordinary. I'm not, I said curtly. Yes, yes, you are, he replied. I know this sounds insultingly presumptuous, but I'm sure you are who you say you are, but it's quite another thing to know. I gave him what he asked for. Merely by rolling up my left coat sleeve to the elbow, I became a performing freak for the first time in my life. It was a moment of absolutely no drama for me, no impact. He seemed satisfied the moment he saw the first part of the scar, but I showed him the whole thing, all eight letters, which spelled the Russian word for slanderer, burned into my flesh by a torturer's knife point. A stretch of ruined skin on the underside of my elbow, five inches long, the letters an inch high, astoundingly neat, well-crafted, having healed perfectly, without infection, into the colour of rust. He produced a cigarette from the breast pocket of his janitor's overalls, held it out to me. I took it and lit it, and then it rested forgotten in one hand at my side. How did the key come to be here? I asked him. It was sent to us, unsolicited, he replied. I never met the... the woman. We sent her some papers. She signed them. Which woman? I asked him. What was her name? Ran shook his head, confused. But you would already know that. Her letter said, I don't know, I said. I don't know which woman. It's very important. Her name was Annabel, he said after many seconds had gone by. I don't know any Annabel, I said. Will you let me see the letter? It's not that simple. It was uh, destroyed. Why? They were destroyed because of you, he said. Because of the instructions you wrote down in Montreal. It was Montreal, wasn't it? Then the key shouldn't be here either, I said angrily. What can you show me? Don't you have files? I don't know who this Annabelle is. If he had really known about Montreal, about the instructions written in a blue crayon found on a park bench on the reverse side of a telephone bill scavenged from the trash, if he had honestly internalised any of these things, he was truly short-sighted for believing the conversation over and that I would just step back inside the banquet room to watch some more of the flea market, have a roast beef sandwich and forget what it felt like to have inches of red agony burned into my broken arm. Rand's office was in the basement of the house. We descended through the clammy dark via a flight of creaky wooden stairs and the single windowless room was illuminated only when Ran yanked on a cheap chain attached to an old bulb. A ping-pong table was set in the centre of the small room, but was only meant as a raw storage space. Stacks and stacks of paper lay on it, presumably bills, along with an assortment of repair gadgetry for the various ailments a house that size must have suffered daily. There were also three ancient computers in various states of discombobulation. Parts of outdated computers were scattered all over the basement, evidence of a chronic tinkerer who maybe fixed them and sold them over the internet or to some local electronic shop. Rand looked utterly at home here. 
One entire wall of the basement was cluttered with stacks of plastic pharmacy crates of various colours, and these were what Rand dug through as I stood on the other side of the room, watching a spider scuttle across the cement floor on its way to shelter beneath a dented water heater in one corner. The auction was getting underway again, high above us. It took Rand five silent minutes to come up with something. Perhaps this, he began, trailing off to nothing, turning to me and offering up a single empty envelope. The five by seven airmail envelope had become slightly yellowed over the years by the dank air of the basement. It was addressed to Curator, the National Museum of Romance, in a flowing, wildly slanted feminine script. What's this postmark? I can't read it, I said to Rand. Moscow, he said without looking at it. Moscow, I repeated out of reflex. What was her name? What was Annabelle's last name? Fiedler, he said. It can't be, I said to him. Her last name can't be Fiedler. Do you understand? The letter, the key. They would have come to you either from a Dunning or a Brandt. What else can you show me? There must be more. The box the key came in. She wrote that she was given the key at a funeral, Rand said. The funeral for a Canadian man who built a house for her. A brick house with no walls inside. Jones, yes, Jones, I said. Rand was taken aback once again. You knew him? You knew Jones? Yes, I said hollowly. The speaking of that name did something to my voice, as it always had from the beginning. Took the air out of it for two full seconds. I knew the man. Why is the story in the catalogue so inaccurate? I snapped at him. Why does the catalogue say I escaped from prison? I didn't escape, Mr. Rand. They blindfolded me and dumped me off a train. I walked for six days to find someone. The woman who wrote the letter, he protested. We went by her word. The girls, the girls who helped Miss Ross. Why did you create this place? I cut him off. It wasn't because you thought you'd get rich. You stand there and you look at me as if I were Jesus Christ. You'd probably look at everyone that way, if you saw them, every person in every one of these insipid stories. You go by the word of one woman you never met face to face. You didn't ask who she was. You just took the key and put it on display for every stranger who bought a ticket to look at it. What atrocity are you atoning for, Mr. Rand? What sort of fantasies of your own have you been funding? I'm sorry. I truly am, Rand said to me. Things are what they are. There was nothing more to say, and so he left me then. He moved past me and walked back up the stairs, leaving me to file through every paper ever related to the museum above me, if I so desired. I waited just long enough for him to be fully out of sight, and then I climbed the stairs too, to play out the string of my addiction. From the River Room Two cloth dolls owned by Uta Saxer of Falkensee, Germany, and three handbound books of her handwritten stories, completed between 1942 and 1944, donated by Anita Saxer. Fearing for their eight-year-old daughter's safety as World War II brought the threat of air raids and hunger upon them, Klaus and Claire Saxer arranged for relatives to take care of the girl in the small town of Premnitz, until it seemed safe for the family to be together once more. All Uta could take with her on her journey, seventy miles westward, was her clothing and two plainly dressed cloth dolls, which had been given to her by a German soldier who boarded briefly with the Saxers near Christmas time. She named the dolls Dieter and Lusa. Dieter had been the German soldier's name. She pretended the dolls had gotten married in the middle of the war, and that Dieter was often called away for weeks at a time to fight for his country. In Uta's imaginings, Lusa sometimes fought right beside him, and at the end of the day they always returned to a small cabin in the woods to play piano music and tend to their farm. Given some writing paper by the aunt and uncle who took her in, Uta immediately began to write stories of Dieter and Luce's adventures in the war and outside of it. 
She spent many days writing these innocent tales, and even when she told her guardian she was writing other sorts of stories, she was really writing about the life of her two dolls. It was a saga she never got tired of. Whenever she said she was imagining stories about animals or monsters or faraway lands, it was simply not true. She lied to appease her guardians, who told her she was spending too much time with the ragged, poorly made dolls. When the war finally ended, Uda, all of eleven years old, returned to her parents' home. Her move back to the house necessitated the transport of a very large sack she had found in the woods and used to store her Dita and Lusa stories, all nine hundred of them, totaling more than two thousand pages. She had kept her secret parcel from everyone. Her parents were stunned, at first by the enormous amount of writing she had done, and then by the astounding flights of imagination Uta had made. Her doll's adventures encircled what Uta had known of the globe. They'd had nine children, who had themselves grown up to fight in the war against America and Russia, had broken apart and reunited dozens of times, had faced death again and again, moved from Germany to Poland, to Italy, to Sweden, and back to Germany, owned businesses, invented machines, written plays, saved the lives of entire battalions with their bravery during their excursions into the war. All this happened to two plainly dressed cloth dolls with faces of almost no detail, sewn together hastily with middling materials, and bought for virtually nothing from some unknown junk shop. Uda's parents had an idea to get in touch somehow with the German soldier who had given Uda those dolls, one of which had been named for him. They hoped to make him a gift of two or three of the stories, in the hopes they might warm his heart after all his sacrifices for their defeated country. They learned eventually that he had fled Poland after Germany's surrender, and had been for one year a guard at Treblinka, one of the most nightmarish death camps of the Holocaust. Uda's parents did not tell her of this. Instead, they allowed the deeder of their daughter's stories to remain brave and true, and eternally devoted to the doll named Lusa. They did not read each and every one of the doll's adventures, but if they had, they would have come across a two-page account of Dieter's refusal to turn in a Jewish family, who appeared on his and Luce's farm one day, asking to be hidden from their pursuers. Because of his kindness, Luce made him a special dinner of sweet potatoes and corn, which were his favorite foods, and which were shared with the Jewish family, before they thanked their hosts and sailed off to America and to safety. Lot 30 was announced for sale at 2.39 p.m. By that time, more than half of the crowd in attendance when the auction began had departed after paying for their prizes by cash or check in the museum's front room or simply having lost interest in the goings-on. Rance Munchik read the story of Lot 30 just as it had been printed on a durable gold-plated card for display in the museum for the past four years and 11 months. The entire tale ran but six paragraphs I tried not to listen, tried to shift as much of my focus as was possible to the rainfall. My name had thankfully been omitted from the Gold Key's history, and so I was spared the ghastly sound of it being spoken by Munchik as if I were a fictional character in a dark fairy tale. When he completed it, inaccurate as it was, he added a couple of sentences about the intrinsic value of the key itself. Any tinge of sentimental fascination in the crowd more than likely vanished into thin air when it was said that the elements of the six-inch, seven-ounce key were valued at $4,300. I finally looked up, as chance would have it, directly into the eyes of a woman sitting five rows in front of me. For some reason, she was not looking at Munchik or Roth, or at the key, but back at me. She looked away almost as soon as I noticed her, turning to the windows abashedly. Instantly, I knew somehow that during the reading of the story, she had seen the way my eyes had clung to the floor for shelter for the seven-minute descent into a time twenty years past, 
and had intuitively singled me out as one of the characters in the sordid, impossible tale. She had sensed it. She had placed no bids that day. She had travelled here alone, had merely sat towards the front and listened. It might be that she was just here to glimpse anyone, anyone at all, who might have been part of the history of all those artefacts. It might have been for like a movie in which one character would at some point step off the screen to make her believe in impossible things. She must have been gravely disappointed. The only prize she would get that day was a two-second glance into my eyes, and then I stood up and moved to the back of the room as the bidding began. The bidding began at $4,000. Someone instantly accepted that opening bid, a skinny man in a bow tie and a dark blue suit who looked like a humorless caricature of a bookworm. I was not forced to raise my hand slightly to my side to place a bid on the key until its price had reached $4,700. The bidding had bounced between the scholarly man in the front and a slender, similarly frowning corporate-looking woman who leaned forward in her chair and bid with a numbered paddle. The pretty woman struck me as a proxy for some unseen third party. At 4,700 there was a gap of silence, perhaps five seconds in duration, after which Munchik said, Going once! And then I raised my hand to shoulder height, and then it seemed like I'd won. There were no follow-up bids until Munchik was almost ready to tap his gavel lightly on the podium. Then, off to my left, someone raised a paddle and said, 4,800, in a strong, educated voice. And I looked in that direction to see a man and a woman in their early thirties, smiling and nodding. They were dressed in typical yuppie weekend attire. The man in tan slacks and a blue button shirt, the woman whose screamingly blonde ponytailed hair clashed awkwardly with her overly tanned skin, wearing a prim grey blouse and new blue jeans. She gripped her husband's right arm companionably and had her left hooked possessively around his shoulders. And when he announced his first bid on Lot 30, she rubbed his arm excitedly and affectionately. He beamed. Anniversary gift. Just back from vacation in the Poconos. No children yet, no time. Married three years. Maybe one more than that. No one spoke up after the married software designer or copyright lawyer or aerospace engineer announced his bid, so I went $100 higher. And then it was just he and I, with the wife supporting him every step of the way with her possessive touches, the bidding eclipsed $5,000 quite quickly. Within seconds it became clear that the man was going to raise his red paddle automatically every time I raised my hand. And he did so proudly, but with an affected modesty, careful not to be too automatic for fear of appearing predatory. They did not look back at me, ever. No matter how strongly I slowly began to will them to, it could not have been more obvious that this was a present for his smiling wife. 5,200... 5,003. Rance Munchik pointed back and forth, really enjoying himself, feeling a little less like he was overseeing a backwards flea market, a little more than a television face, an authority figure. At 5,400, the patent attorney, or yacht broker, clumsily dropped his paddle in raising it, and he quickly scooped it up with a grin, causing the crowd to laugh at his anxiousness to get it into the air, to keep his hands on lot 30, no matter what how I hated him at that moment, him and his blonde wife, the young marrieds who had seen the notice of the auction in the newspaper while perusing it for Saturday plans, or maybe, to give them the benefit of the doubt, they'd visited the museum once six months before and had promised to go back again one day, maybe when the curators put out more things and more stories. Eight dollars was a bit high for admission. And maybe the wife had carried on a bit about the loveliness of the gold key, which had no corresponding lock and he'd filed it away, giving himself all the credit in the world for remembering it, jotting a note on a post-it at his office to the effect that he would get her something similarly unique for her birthday. He had worked long, long hours recently, so many projects to complete, but so very profitable, and she always with her dinner waiting for him, even though working on real estate settlements in her office in the den was really quite exhausting sometimes. He would treat her, get her something really special. The boat had been nice, they both loved the boat, but this would be just for her. I hated them for the easiest reasons of all, for their perfection and for their good nature, but mostly because of their romance, the sweep of their love story, had probably reached its forgettable apex with an evening trip to some county fair 
eight years before, when they were just out of college, when he had won a stuffed giraffe for her at the ring toss, causing her to promise him that no matter what he could ever provide for her from that point on, the giraffe would mean more to her than anything, and they had kissed and planned for the future, these county fair lovers, and had never looked back. The county fair lovers left suffering and regret and knife-polluted flesh to people in best-selling books and museum placards, and would never understand why anyone would want anything more than a stuffed giraffe to put in the closet to take out from time to time for innocent, uncluttered reminiscence. They were right. No one should have wanted more than that, it was true. But oh, how I needed them to lose. How easily my anger for them broke my composure and my mind's fragile firewall, until my hands were shaking long before my final bid, and my brain was lost in images of their ruination and mortal embarrassment. At some point in that slow-motion train wreck, the amount bid on Lot 30 exceeded the amount of money I'd stored away inside my coat, everything I had in the world, and yet I still kept bidding, fully knowing I had lost, because I believed it punished them just a little, made them go several hundred dollars higher, and this had at least been of some value to me. Perhaps some heretofore silent bidder would become excited by the duel and jump into the fray himself. Then the county fair lovers would lose, have their pretty dream shattered. But this didn't happen, and all the sentiment in the room remained on their side. I certainly looked like the heartless shark who was trying to steal the key from them so it could be sold for twice the auction amount to some shadowy other, some private collector in New York or Los Angeles only I knew about. Finally, I had to stop. Not because the county fair lovers seemed about to break. They never would have, I don't think, even at nine or ten thousand. But because I began to feel physically disconnected from myself. As if my body were trying to faint and lift me upward, out of the house altogether. Munchik's announcement that Lot 30 was sold to the man with the renegade paddle snapped me out of this fug, just enough to send my legs out of the banquet room with a suddenness the crowd must have taken as childish petulance. No one saw me enter the foyer and step over the impotent piece of string which purported to rope off the upper floor of the museum. The assistants sitting in the main room were too busy finalising the transaction for the sale of other lots to notice. The man who had bought for $2,000 a duelling sword, once owned by a pathetic and deluded French cuckold, stabbed to death in 1744 while defending a wife he believed pure, was asking question after question about how he would go about having it shipped to him in Baltimore. The stairs creaked, but I was not followed. There were just the two rooms at the top of the stairs, one to the left, one to the right. Both were empty, stripped of their wallpaper, in preparation for a modest remodelling, maybe, hinting that the house itself would be sold next, by spring at the latest. A photograph on page two of the auction catalogue had showed this room at the height of its popularity. I remembered the frozen image of the two couples reading the stories of artefacts placed on simple half-lectons, absorbing those stories by the light of two standing lamps. Lot 30 had lived right here, beside the window. When I'd picked up my catalogue the night before and turned to that page, it was the first time I'd seen the key in twenty years. There were ways to get it back. Theft, burglary, outright robbery, the brazen, treasonous act which had drawn the key into the possession of a disturbed woman who had ordered me held captive in Gatchina did not have to be the last radical episode in its mute history. I looked out of the east window of the top floor of the Museum of Romance. A few hundred yards away, through the tree line, a stretch of the elevated highway could be seen. There had been a terrible crash. The cars involved were not themselves visible to me. All that could be deciphered through the trees and the wash of rain was that soundless flash of red, orange and yellow lights, a dozen or more of them huddled tightly together in a mournful mass, and a grouping of inert white surfaces which suggested the emergency vehicles that hosted them. Some of the winking emergency lights merged and balletically crossed paths, the vehicles manoeuvring just enough to reveal a new pattern of those pretty primary colours. The one moment out there on the highway, when things had collided and histories had been wildly altered, was silently photographed and then allowed to disperse. And then somewhere, a hummingbird continued to robotically flap its wings 
70 times per second, all around the wounded and the dead. From the White Room, The Purifying Dream, an unpublished manuscript by Dr. Leonard Masterman, circa 1940, donated by the estate of Leonard Masterman. Masterman, a controversial psychiatrist who lived and worked in Ottawa, Canada until his death in 1955, spent many years honing a new form of therapy for his patients who suffered guilt, regret, and depression over the loss of a former spouse or lover. Frustrated by the power of this sadness which gripped so many people despite months and even years of talk therapy, Masterman turned to dream research after documenting his experiences with his own nocturnal wonderings. This led him into hypnosis studies and finally the creation of a three-step method which would attempt to rid a patient of tortured memories of his or her ex-loves once and for all. He used hypnosis to suggest dream scripts to his patients, scripts in which they would first confront the person who had caused them such pain, then forgive them, and then release them utterly through what he called the purifying dream. The first part of the therapy was called the bridging dream, over which the patient would have no control whatsoever, experiencing only what Masterman suggested during the hypnotic state. It consisted of a final meeting with the ex-lover, usually in some peaceful seaside location. The patient would say everything he or she had always meant to say to the person, and then promise that they would meet up again some day in the future. That future day would come just a week or so later, after Masterman had hypnotized the patient a second time and created a resolutive dream in which that same seaside location was the scene of the two lovers embracing one last time, before the patient voluntarily gave a final kiss, offering total forgiveness for past wrongs. Masterman went so far as to set the dream in a future time in which both parties had physically aged about fifteen years. The third, or purifying dream, would come a month afterward, in it, the patient would be alone in a new location, usually a field in summertime, surrounded by a natural beauty overwhelming in its peace and serenity. Basking in sunshine and comfort, the patient would stand before an imaginary easel, painting the clouds that passed overhead. Upon waking from this third dream, some patients whom Masterman had been unable to help through talk therapy would be utterly cured of the devastating sadness their lovers had cursed them with. They described themselves as feeling utterly freed and resolved, and more grateful for the life that had been given them. One or two people claimed that standing in that summer field was the most beautiful moment of their time on earth, despite the fact that it existed solely in their sleeping imaginations, instilled in them through a session of hypnosis just a few hours before. The key to the dream therapy, Masterman wrote, was that the patient could not be fully told why he or she was being hypnotized, otherwise the trio of dreams they experienced might be altered and corrupted. When they spoke of their dreams to him the next day, the patients believed them to be completely random and did not know they had been manipulated. This caused great skepticism and criticism on the part of Masterman's contemporaries, who felt he might be violating ethical principles. They mostly attributed his success with the method to a psychological placebo effect. To this day, his therapy has not caught on, though his unpublished book cites a dozen cases where it seemed to greatly help his patients. He was frustrated to find that the therapy did not seem to work with people who had suffered other sorts of traumas, emotional injuries inflicted in childhood, for example, or physical abuse, or grief over a death. For whatever reason, the purifying dream seemed to set free only those who wanted to break away from a lost love. In his book's coda, he wrote that he sometimes wished the therapy had been the brainchild of someone else so that he might have had the benefit of it in his late twenties, when the memory of a woman named Ellen caused him overwhelming heartache for several years. Despite being placed under hypnosis by fellow doctors near the end of his long life, some part of Masterman's mind corrupted his dream images and his dream scripts, 
and he never was able to experience in sleep a summer field whose beauty and simplicity could release him from the fading traces of his past. Instead, he always seemed to find himself alone on a wintry landscape in a land he did not recognize, clutching a letter Ellen had written him decades before. A message of thanks for a picnic they'd shared on a flawless Sunday afternoon in the country. When the entire auction was over, when the prize winners, the pretenders, and the defeated had left for good, a small man in dark blue coveralls made several trips from the museum's back entrance to a green van parked in the yard, carrying with him several items which had received no bids whatsoever. From my own parked car across the road, I'd watched them all, every single person who'd been at the auction, get into their cars and drive away leaving only Rand to take out the trash, so to speak. He put some of the unsold items into large cardboard boxes that had originally been used to transport TV sets and a Macintosh computer. He took each item through the light drizzle that had finally replaced the domineering rain and set the box or bulging shopping bag gently in the back of the van and when he'd completed his runs back and forth, he got in and drove away like all the others. It was 3.45 p.m. I started my car and followed Rand's van as he headed north on 74, keeping six or seven car lengths behind him. He drove past the town of Woodbine, and then in Steelman Town he took a left onto something called Firesmith Lane, which was dotted with farmhouses every quarter mile or so, and little else but rolling hills and road signs warning of ever more bends and curves. He was on Firesmith for ten minutes, when he cued his left turn signal once more and turned onto an unmarked path of packed gravel. Out here in the middle of nowhere, the drizzle had tapered to almost nothing. The path was much longer than I would have guessed. I breasted two more grassy hills in a perfectly straight line, just barely seeing Rand's brake lights well up ahead. The path ended, I saw, at a mostly featureless barn, surrounded on all sides by a scruffy patch of packed dirt that had become mud and beyond that, several acres of unused land. Rand stopped his van beside the barn and cut the engine. I did the same from about 200 yards away, so that Rand was little more than a dot in my vision and would have been unable to make out my vehicle through the mist. I watched him begin the process of transporting each of the unsold auction items into that lonely barn. When he'd taken the last parcel in and did not immediately emerge again, I started my rental car once more, pulled it well off the gravel road into the drenched grass, and left it there. I got out and started to walk down the gravel path toward the barn. It was cold, shockingly cold, with the onset of dusk. I did not know what my purpose was, but I kept walking, the thin grey mist settling in my bones. I gave Rand's van a wide berth and ambled off to the right, around the side of the completely windowless unpainted barn. I turned the corner and saw that on the far end the barn was wide open, a pair of double doors having been propped wide, one held firm by a bag of mulch, the other by a very old lawn mower. I walked to this rear entrance and, by keeping my body mostly out of sight, peered inside. The barn's interior was lit by a professionally constructed line of overhead beams which ran from the front entrance to the back. In front of me were four enormous sets of industrial metal racks which also extended some 30 yards to the rear and were lined up in formal rows, dividing the barn into four distinct adjacent sections. Each rack was three shelves high, the shelves allowing for about five vertical feet of storage space, so I had to crane my neck upwards a bit to see to the top. A good-sized ladder would have been needed to reach the topmost rack. The storage racks were cluttered with red-taped and reconfigured cardboard boxes scavenged from previous purchases of computer printers, sporting equipment, lamps, wine, oranges, CD players, board games. Each box stored an unseen object, and between the boxes still more random things lay on the shelves, yet to be created or perhaps never to be. I saw a rocking chair, a bag of golf clubs a clay sculpture the size of a small refrigerator depicting a weary, eternally trudging soldier, 
a huge hunk of raw rock in which was embedded a glass-protected photograph of a German shepherd, three or four paintings, a few notebooks, a short, long-dead bonsai tree, something that appeared to be a wedding dress that had been half scarred by flame, more things everywhere I looked. At the far entrance, Archer Rand was cradling one of the auction lots, a small wooden crate hiding a Ouija board once used by four different men to contact the spirit of a beloved Irish prostitute in his arms as he spoke to a woman whose back was turned to me. He then turned and placed the crate onto the open rack closest to him, where the other unsold auction items now rested. Rand walked past her, uttering one more word, causing her to nod again. He touched her right arm briefly and then left the barn. From the angle at which I stood, I could see the grill of his van through the open door and watched as Rand got back inside, cued the headlights and pulled away with a small wave for the anonymous woman. She waved back. Then the van's tyres were chewing through the thin layer of mud outside the barn and Rand departed. She saw me almost immediately, that woman. She turned and there I was, 40 yards away, on the other side of the barn. She moved languidly, unalarmed by my presence, never accelerating nor slowing her gait. From far away she looked to me to be about 30 years old, but as she drew closer the subtle, in her case extremely subtle, signs of age became visible on her face, though the way she walked belied that age. She must have been a dancer, even an athlete, in her earlier years. She wore a brown sweater and a dark brown skirt on a very slender frame. A striking fifty-five, maybe even a flawless sixty. She smiled at me kindly. Hello, she said. I saw you at the auction. Lot thirty. I'm very sorry you didn't get it. I don't remember you, I said to her. My name is Patrice, she said, and offered her right hand to me. I shook it lamely. I'm the curator of the museum. What about Rand? I asked her. We both are, I suppose, she said modestly. Yes, I take far too much credit. What is this place? This barn belonged to a blind farmer who used to deliver strawberries to my family, said Patrice. He built it after he lost his sight completely, almost entirely by himself. We've always found much more for the museum than we could ever put on display, so most of it came here over the years. We need a new heater in here, I think. Some of the things aren't doing so well. What will happen to them now, I asked her. They'll stay here, she said simply. Would you like to take a walk through? We walked together the way movies have made me imagine that people in Victorian times used to walk along riverbanks and strands during formal courtships. We had no starting point and no ending point, and there was nothing she in particular wished to show me, no grand finale. Did Rand really set it all up as a business proposition, I asked her straight away. No, she said with a smile. We were man and woman a long time ago, you know, the way it truly means. Together. Lovers. It was our idea, the two of us. I had money, and he had the need to work on something, something bigger than he was. We stopped a couple of years ago, we're getting a bit old, and we knew the museum would have to end. The two of you were never married? I asked. No, no, she said gently. But we were together for nine years. She trailed off there for just a moment. I spent that moment absorbing the procession of objects. Above eye level, a cardboard silverware box labelled emails and notes, a large crucifix attached to a string bearing a profusion of multicoloured beads, a child's sled clumsily painted yellow by tiny hands. We almost destroyed each other, Patrice told me. We're colleagues now, she said. It seemed almost impossible that we would ever be friends, but that's exactly what happened. We vowed to kill each other one night, in the middle of it all, just so we could go on being lovers eternally. We actually bought pistols. We walked on. Where are the histories of these things? I asked. Where are they written? They're not, she said. Here, the details don't matter. We don't keep track of them. Everything means as much as everything else. It's not like the museum. This is more of a refuge. I mused on that for a moment. Hundreds of objects, and the history of each known only to her and maybe to Rand. You'll keep this place, though, I said, even though the museum's gone? Yes. What for? 
She looked at the things she had collected, walking mutely past. A leather jacket, an empty antique birdcage. Oh, I imagine Archer will want to come back and look at all this sometimes. And so will I, as I get more and more sentimental in my old age, she said. And I have a niece, she's seven now. When she decides to get married, I'd like to show her all this, her and her husband, before the actual ceremony. Just have a walk through, like we're doing. Not as any sort of lesson, just that it would be a nice walk. She folded her arms in front of her as the cold from outside reached into the barn and clawed us a bit. Maybe, she said, we'll be able to think of a better ending to all this. Maybe that's why I keep the barn going. It's like we started some vast story and no resolution seems right or fair. We don't know how to close the book. We came to the end of the shelves, the end of the racks. I had seen all there was to see. I regretted the last leg of our walk, which led to the front entrance and the ever-thickening mist, because though she had told me everything she could, I felt as if what I had come looking for had simply never been here at all. It wasn't with Rand either, that was obvious. It was with Lot 30, and when I had lost it, everything that could possibly come after was moot. I knew somehow that when this night ended and I awoke the next day in my gutted apartment, my history of romances was utterly, irrevocably over. That I had been meant to discover the museum and the auction and make my final bid, and then never again to be with a woman. Never dream of one, fight for one, lose one, even desire one. And the rest of my life I knew would either be tolerable or intolerable. But it would belong to no one but myself. Hands that might reach out would be firmly turned away. Leaving the barn would be merely the last step in that progression towards a comforting, resolute loneliness that I would make into a lasting friend. That is all I ever wanted of anything. I never asked for prison, for a woman named Marta, for her twisted betrayal, for a beautiful saviour called Anchor, for something I had been labelled with that some blindly called heroism, but which I knew had simply been desperation. None of that story would be tinged now by its reflection through someone new. My perspective on it was finally as rigid as stone. With the museum's dissolution, it would never have to be spoken of again. Patrice and I fell silent for a time. Then, just as we got to the door, I asked, Why didn't you two run the place together? I never even saw your name anywhere. It's not good for Archer and I to work together, she told me. He had a horrible problem with drinking after we broke apart. First I was the enemy, then drinking. So I gave him the money to run the museum, and that was his job and his support. There were some financial mistakes, some very bad ones recently, but after all, it couldn't go on forever. In the far distance, lights came on around the only farmhouse visible to us, calibrated to sense the darkness and respond to it. The porch was illuminated, and so was a little doghouse near the driveway. Stay here, Patrice said. I want to give you something. She walked back towards the shelves. I looked at the farmhouse in the distance and saw a tiny figure emerge onto the front porch. From what I could make out of it, it was a boy, and he clapped his hands towards the doghouse. A shaggy mass appeared out of its depths, trotted up to the porch steps, and disappeared into all that warmth. The child remained for a moment, then seemed to turn in my direction. I saw one hand raise, and then the boy began to wave at me with great enthusiasm, eyes drawn to me by the lights inside the barn, a rarity to him that demanded a response. Who knew how little the boy had seen of the lonely barn's owners? It was an event that someone should be in there. He waved and waved, and finally I raised my own hand weakly in return. Satisfied, the boy went back inside the house and closed the door. It had been so easy to make him happy. It cost me nothing. Patrice returned and stood close to me, holding out a black shoebox marked with the logo of a popular chain store. A piece of white string held the cover taut. To make up for you not winning your bid, she said. I took the box from her. What is it? I asked. Oh, it's just something from the shelves here, she said. Some of these things are so old, both Archer and I have forgotten what they meant, what the story was, sometimes even where the things came from. 
It's been 15 years, at least 15, since it was given to us, so it's gone back to being a mystery again. It meant something powerful to someone at some point, and that's all we know for sure, she told me. I guess Archer and I never really understood why anything else matters. Maybe that's what we did wrong. I saw that she had put her hand out once more, asking me silently to take it. I did in something less demonstrative than a handshake. I said goodbye. My hand closed around the car keys in my pocket, and I stepped outside into the cold. It was a long walk up the gravel path, but I did not look back. I put the black shoebox on the passenger seat of my rental car, and referring just once more to that confused, irritating tangle of directions the museum had given me, tried to find my way out of the county. But I didn't have to go far to find a suitable beach on which to open that box that Patrice had bequeathed to me. I came upon a neglected public stretch of waterfront just five miles from the barn, on the road to Cape May, and I parked my car in a paved lot and walked out onto the wet sand just a few minutes before the night sky overtook the sickly afternoon. The far reaches of the ocean blended visually with the horizon into one vaporous, colourless mass. The wind was non-existent and the waves mournfully quiet. The water skated up, printed a giant palm on the earth, retreated, came forward again. I sat down on a bench overlooking the tide line and rested the shoebox beside me. I was alone. Now, I thought, now I will be finally rewarded, for when I open the box, I will be certain to find the key that had been so cruelly taken from me. It will be a gift made out of my respect for the remains of the museum, a token for not revealing the secret of Rand and his old lover's melancholy barn. And the key would be well deserved, for had I not since Friday night endured a perfect sequence the many metaphors of a painful romance, I had fallen under the spell of a new discovery, wandered unfamiliar roads which did not lead where they seemed to promise, been made a fool of by someone who claimed to mean me no harm. I had gambled everything I owned, only to learn nothing from the experience and gamble it all again in the name of some unquenchable passion. And after all was said and done, being left with no one, I had reached out for closure to my suffering only to walk away from a fascinating woman in possession of something quite different from what I believed I deserved. It was a storyline every man had known through a thousand generations, what we begged for in our most secret dreams, and now I had known it once again, all in the space of twenty hours. But this time, Rand and his partner would certainly bring me a just ending, a swift and fitting response to the theft perpetrated against me by the county fair lovers, who had undoubtedly got back to their new redecorated kitchen only to find their parcel had been deviously switched. I undid the string that held my prize and lifted the lid, relishing my hatred of that charmed couple and their officious love story, and took from the shoebox a withered, time-battered doll, seventy years or more in age, a giraffe to be exact, a stuffed carnival prize with one eye missing, a friendly giraffe wearing a red shirt with a blue heart on it. The colours faded away to only a hint of what they had once been, grey stuffing protruding from a tear in one foot and a gash suffered on one shoulder. It could not have weighed more than four ounces, this relic, and I cradled it in both hands as I lifted it out into the cold winter air. The giraffe's lone button eye looked into the sky with perfect innocence, brushed by the icy wind, barely able to withstand its punishment. Weakened further by more than a decade locked in a tiny barn in the middle of nowhere. Lost to light, sound, and the touch of some woman who had once cared for it more than she could ever say. The memories of her night at the carnival, the arc lights, the smell of apples, and the young man who became her laughing hero with one mighty throw of a baseball, had for melancholy and forgotten reasons been left to caretakers she would never know and now belonged forever to a stranger shedding a torrent of unnoticed tears beside the New Jersey shoreline, sitting motionless as the dark progressed around him, the last man to remember, endure, and tell of the end of the Museum of Romance. <laughs>